Growing up, my family owned a modest vacation home nestled among the vast farmlands of rural America. It wasn't grand, but it was our escape from the bustling city life. As the second oldest of four brothers, I found that these trips were filled with endless adventure, especially during the long, lazy summers of our childhood. Our parents would watch from the porch as we played in the fields until the sun dipped below the horizon. But one summer, our playful innocence was shattered, and our beloved getaway would never feel the same again. It was a particularly warm day when my brothers and I decided to expand our usual play area. Beyond our property lay an old, mysterious farmhouse surrounded by a sprawling cornfield. The farmhouse had been unoccupied for as long as I could remember, its windows boarded up, giving it a ghostly aura. Propelled by the fearless curiosity that only children possess, we ventured towards it. As the oldest, I felt responsible for keeping a watchful eye on my younger brothers as we approached the eerie structure. The corn was high that season, towering over our heads and creating a green labyrinth that whispered secrets with every breeze. It was the perfect setting for a game of hide and seek, and we dispersed eagerly, disappearing among the rustling stalks. The game started innocently enough, with shouts and laughter echoing through the cornfield. I had found a particularly good hiding spot and crouched down, trying to quiet my breathing. That's when I heard it, a shuffling sound, not far from where I was hiding. Assuming it was one of my brothers trying to sneak up on me, I stayed silent, listening carefully. But the pattern of movement was odd, hesitant yet deliberate. It didn't sound like any of my brothers. As dusk turned to night, we switched to playing flashlight tag, a game that now seems hauntingly ominous given the setting. With only our flashlights to guide us, the cornfield transformed into a shadowy maze. I was it, and as I swept my beam across the dark rows, I caught a glimpse of someone standing far off in the distance. Thinking I had found my youngest brother, I approached, calling out to him. The figure remained still, and as I got closer, I aimed my flashlight upward, revealing not the familiar face of my sibling, but the ghastly visage of a man partially obscured by the corn. His face seemed disfigured, with deep shadows concealing his features, and his eyes glinted oddly in the light. Frozen with fear, I heard him speak in a hoarse whisper, Can I play too? His voice was chilling, devoid of any warmth. Panic took over, and I screamed for my brothers, turning on my heel and running as fast as I could back to the safety of our home. We told our parents what happened, and though they were skeptical at first, the genuine terror in our eyes convinced them something sinister had occurred. The local police found no one when they searched the area, but the incident left us all shaken. Our nights at the vacation home were never peaceful again, and eventually, my parents decided to sell the property. Now, years later, I often reflect on that summer night. The memory is a vivid blend of childhood joy and heart-stopping fear, a reminder of the thin veil between innocence and the darkness that can lurk just beyond the safe confines of home. The cornfield, the night, and that haunting face in the flashlight beam are etched in my mind forever, a chilling echo of the night when our games turned into a nightmare. It was the summer of 2019, a season of searing heat and silent nights. My grandparents, who owned a sprawling farm in the rural outskirts of town, had planned a week-long getaway, leaving me in charge. I was a city kid, 19 and somewhat naive, relishing the solitude and space that only the country could offer. The day passed uneventfully, with me attending to the usual farm chores. As night fell, the farm transformed. Shadows stretched long and deep, and the sounds of nightlife crept in with the creeping dark. I was lounging on the porch with a book when I first heard it, a distant, unsettling sound that wasn't part of the usual evening chorus. The cows in the nearby barn were restless, 
mooing anxiously in a way I had never heard before. Curiosity pricked at my spine, urging me forward into the dimming light, grabbing a flashlight and my grandfather's old shotgun. For comfort more than anything, I headed towards the barn. The air was thick with the scent of unsettled animals. Even the crickets seemed to hold their breath. Inside the barn, the cows shuffled and pushed against each other, their eyes wide and darting. Counting them, I noticed immediately one was missing. A thread of anxiety wove its way through my thoughts as I left the barn to track the missing cow. The noise led me to the edge of the sprawling cornfield. The stalks whispered among themselves, and a deeper, more rhythmic sound pulsed just beyond visibility. Heart thumping, I ventured in. With every step, the dry rustle of corn leaves seemed to echo louder, the whispers turning into murmurs. I walked deeper than I intended, the flashlight's beam catching nothing but endless rows of corn until it happened. A sudden, eerie silence followed by a slow, deliberate chant. I froze, the sense of something profoundly wrong washing over me in an icy wave. Gripping the shotgun tightly, I fired into the air, a desperate warning shot. The chanting stopped abruptly. Silence. Then, the rustle of movement as figures appeared, cloaked in darkness and masked in grotesque caricatures that seemed to mock the very essence of humanity. My breath caught in my throat. They were circling, slowly closing in. I backed away, my mind racing with images of what horrific intention they might harbor. But I wasn't going down without a fight. I yelled, threatened, fired another shot into the night sky. My display of defiance seemed to pause their advance. Using the moment, I turned and ran, not stopping until I burst from the cornfield's edge, lungs screaming, legs burning. I didn't look back until I reached the house, slamming and locking the door behind me. I called the police, my voice a mix of fear and outrage, reporting everything. They arrived quickly, but the masked group was gone, leaving behind a chilling scene in the cornfield. A cow's head, grotesquely severed and encircled by flickering candles. The night was long, Blue and red lights painted the farm as officers moved through the area. When my parents arrived in the early hours, the relief was palpable. I recounted everything, the fear, the chase, the ritualistic tableau, all under their horrified gazes. The following days were a blur of questions with no answers. My grandparents returned, deeply shaken, and promptly installed a high-tech security system but the shadows of that night lingered. The mystery of the masked group and their unspeakable ritual remained, haunting the whispers of the cornfield, a reminder of the darkness hidden in the quiet of the country. Leaving the farm, I couldn't shake the feeling of eyes watching from the corn, whispering secrets only the night could understand. As I turned the keys in my new pickup, the engine roared to life. It sounded a deep purr that filled me with a sense of adventure. This weekend was supposed to be a reunion and a celebration rolled into one. Catching up with my childhood friend, Tristan, at his family's expansive rural farm. The rolling hills and quiet solitude of the countryside were calling, and I was eager to leave the city's incessant buzz behind. Driving down the familiar, tree-lined roads that led to Tristan's place, memories of our childhood adventures played like an old movie in my mind. But this visit was special. Not only was it a chance to show off my new truck, but also to relive those carefree days, if only for a weekend. Tristan greeted me with the same wide grin and bear hug that had been his signature since we were kids. You've got to see the trails we've got now, he boasted as we walked around the farm, his enthusiasm infectious. The day was spent catching up, and as the sun began to set, painting the sky with strokes of orange and purple, Tristan suggested an exploration trip for the next day. There's this old church nearby, 
abandoned for decades. It's a bit creepy, honestly. Want to check it out? His eyes sparkled with the thrill of impending adventure, and I couldn't resist. The next morning, armed with our sense of adventure, we set off. The trails were rough and untamed, perfect for putting my truck through its paces. Tristan directed me through paths only locals knew, each turn and dip bringing a new wave of excitement. But nothing prepared us for the sight of the abandoned church. It stood, a somber silhouette against the stark blue sky, its once hallowed walls now surrendered to the embrace of ivy and rot. As we approached, a chill ran down my spine. The air felt heavier, charged with a silent whisper of the past. Our footsteps echoed as we entered, disturbing the quiet sanctity of the place. It was empty or so we thought, until a sudden movement in the shadows caught our eye. A figure, draped in tattered robes, stood motionless by the altar. Its face was obscured, and it seemed almost unreal. Hello, Tristan called out, his voice echoing off the crumbling walls. There was no answer. We stepped closer, curiosity overcoming fear, until the figure abruptly turned and stared directly at us. The eyes, or where the eyes should have been, were hollow, endless pits that seemed to pierce right through us. Panic seized us as the figure advanced. We ran, stumbling over debris, our breaths ragged with fear. The echo of our footsteps was accompanied by another set, faster, angrier. We burst through the church doors, the daylight momentarily blinding us. Without looking back, we raced through the adjoining cornfield, the stalks clawing at our clothes as if trying to hold us back. Finally reaching the truck, we slammed the doors shut and sped away, not stopping until the church was nothing but a distant silhouette. That night, we barely slept, the image of the hollow-eyed figure haunting the edges of our dreams. The following day, with Tristan's father, we went back, this time to retrieve our bicycles left in our panicked escape. The church stood silent, more menacing in the daylight. Tristan's father, seeing our shaken demeanor, decided it was time to involve the local authorities. We reported the incident, describing the squatter as a possible threat. As I drove away from Tristan's farm at the end of the weekend, I couldn't stop looking in the rearview mirror, as if expecting to see something or someone still following us. Questions hammered in my head. Who was that man in the abandoned church? What did he want? And why did he scare us so much? The image of that place and that sinister figure wouldn't leave my mind, and I knew this weekend adventure would stick with me for a long time. It was a weekend story I would never forget. It was a typical Saturday night with the kind of easy camaraderie that comes from good neighbors and better friends. Emily and I had invited James and his wife over to our place, a cozy farmhouse nestled on the outskirts of town, for some drinks and board games. The laughter was loud, the spirits were high, and the night wore on into comfortable darkness. By the time they left, the world outside was pitch black, shrouded in the silence of a rural evening. We cleaned up a bit, still chuckling over a particularly ridiculous play in our last game of Monopoly, and then we headed to bed. It wasn't long before the sounds of the countryside lulled us toward sleep. Suddenly, a sharp knocking jolted us awake. I glanced at the clock. It was past midnight. Confused, I got out of bed and headed to the front door, Emily close behind me, her expression mirroring my bewilderment. Who's there? I called out, approaching the door but not yet opening it. Help? Please, I need help. The voice on the other side was hoarse, desperate, but strangely calm. I exchanged a look with Emily. It's probably James messing with us. I whispered, though a part of me doubted it. James loved a good prank, but this seemed off. James, if that's you, cut it out. It's late. 
I said louder, hoping to catch a chuckle or a slip-up, but the response chilled my bones. Please just open the door. I'm hit. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up. This didn't sound like any prank. How did you get hurt? I asked, my voice steadier than I felt. Silence. Then, I, I fell. Please. I grabbed my phone and dialed James's number while keeping my eyes on the door. James, are you outside our house? I asked the moment he picked up. No, man, we just got home. What's up? His voice was clear and sober, a stark contrast to the pleading desperation from the other side of the door. It's not James, I whispered to Emily, seeing her face lose all color. I spoke into the phone. Someone's at our door, saying they're hurt, but something feels off. Stay inside. I'm coming over, James replied, urgency in his tone. The knocking intensified as if whoever was outside knew that we were onto them. Please, I just need to come in, the voice croaked. No, we're calling the police, I declared loudly, trying to sound more courageous than I felt. Emily dialed 911 as we heard what sounded like someone attempting to force the door. My heart pounded in my chest, and I grabbed the nearest thing I could use as a weapon. A heavy flashlight from the drawer. We're inside with the doors locked. Someone is trying to break in. Emily spoke into the phone, her voice trembling. The operator assured us that help was on the way. The next few minutes were the longest of our lives. Every creak and scratch seemed amplified. Every shadow through the frosted glass of the door a potential threat. Finally, we heard the sirens approaching, the sound slicing through the tension like a knife. The police arrived and immediately swept the property. They found no one, just the lingering echo of our pounding hearts and the faintest impressions of muddy boots near the front porch. The officers suggested it might have been someone looking for an easy target, thinking no one was home. After they left, we sat in the living room, the adrenaline slowly ebbing from our veins, replaced by a bone-deep exhaustion. James and his wife stayed with us until dawn, none of us willing to let the night reclaim any sense of normalcy. That night taught us the thin, fragile line between an ordinary evening and one that could turn your life upside down. It lingered in our thoughts, a reminder that sometimes the real horror is not knowing what could have happened.